For the tank folk, this should be good evening. I believe this should be the session. <clears throat> Sorry, I got stuff in my throat. This should be the second session, so I'm guessing about 7 o'clock, 7.30, something like that. First session, we talked about... What did we talk about? So for me, it's been a long night. I had some technical difficulties, so I had to figure some stuff out. So I was up really, really late. And you're like, stop whining, John. What did we talk about? Oh, yeah, The Fall of Man. <laughs> um, and I forgot one of my props, so I was going to talk to you about my book. Um, I wrote Blight in the Vineyard. Uh, I won't do the tagline because I can't ever remember it, which is really crazy. But nonetheless, it's on Amazon, uh, $23.99. Uh, I am a capitalist, so please buy it. Make me rich, please. Uh, yeah, we talked about the fall of man, and we talked about the implications of what the fall of man, the doctrine, really represents. And I raised the question, if you can't find it in chapter and verse, how can you honestly say um, it's a biblical doctrine? How is that possible? So now we're going to investigate where does that doctrine come from. Um, and since you've all studied my lectures from 2013 to 2016 in depth, and you're very familiar with them, and you're already up to speed in the evolution of Western thought and the intellectual foundations of Christian doctrine, I think, thought I would just do a really brief review. So we start with the Pythagoreans, and they're roughly what? Here, hang on, let me get my notes up. It always helps to have your stuff in order when you actually start talking. So the Pythagoreans are about 570. <clears throat> they are the ones that introduced the soul-body dichotomy into Western thought. It's the first time that we really see in a philosophical sense, as a framework of, of metaphysics, that we have the soul, which is good, spiritual, and the physical, which is evil, uh, the body. And only those, and the way you can tell if somebody has virtue, is only those who are initiated into the mystery of truth, whatever that happens to be for them. Uh, only those people who are initiated into the mystery can know the truth. So, you know, of course, we now actually have a special status, always a theme. There's a special status for a select group of individuals who, somehow or another, are exempt from the corruption of the world, and they are the ones that have the access to the mysteries. <clears throat> the sophists, they were skeptics that man really couldn't know anything. Um, the senses plus reason, that was they were corrupt, and truth is just fundamentally impossible. Um, the cynics and stoics, so for both of them, basically enlightenment is reserved for another dimension, a transcendent salvation from Logos. Now when you hear Logos, don't hear uh, the Gospel of John, Logos. Um, <clears throat> Their Logos was uh, some, a, a variation of Revelation. Um, transcendent salvation from Logos after purification, and the way they became pure to get to their transcendent state was asceticism. Basically, they just beat themselves. You know, They just made their body physically miserable to the pain and suffering of human existence. That was what made them good. So then we come, so by, so by the Cynics and Stoics, we're around 400 BC. Now I took these guys, so Pythagoreans, Sophists, Cynics and Stoics, and then Plato. Now I'm kind of going back in time, but Plato synthesizes pretty much everything that came before. So I wanted to talk about those bit players first and then talk about Plato. Plato integrates all of this into a comprehensive philosophy. Prior to Plato, you had these various strands of thought, but none of them are really systematized or integrated. He comes to the conclusion the only correct form of government was totalitarian rule. Why? Because only enlightened few people are ever really qualified to know the good or truth. And because truth, well, the world, what we really see is just, a, uh, it's a shadow. It doesn't really exist. So what doesn't really exist, very few people can actually see it. <clears throat> and I suddenly saw myself on the monitor and realized you couldn't actually see my hand gesture. So I moved. <laughs> so the main, so um, to maintain earthly good is man must separate himself from earthly considerations and contemplate the good. Even though 
what he really sees is the shadow. So fire in a cave, shadow splash on the wall. All he sees of reality is that thing that is splashed on the wall. Then we reach Plotinus. Plotinus is roughly, looking at my notes here, where is Plotinus? Oh, 200, basically 204 AD to about 270 AD. He is a, he's a throwback to Plato. So the evolution of Western thought, we've had a series of tides and evolutions of thinking, and now we have a resurgent Platonist movement, a Neoplatonist movement, and Plotinus ends up being one of the major figures. And the reason Plotinus is so important is he eradicates the whole... In Plato, there was still a humanist element. Man still had some virtue, even though it was pretty modified, and it was still the of the traditions of the Cynics and Stoics and the uh, Pythagoreans. He still had some sense that, man, there was something okay or good about human beings. Plotinus, nah. All gone. Now Plotinus basically says, man is the essence of corruption in his flesh. And the way that he must basically seek death in an effort to gain life. Uh, you probably hear a theme there in subsequent other doctrines, I'm sure. <clears throat> And the reason he is so significant is because he is the one who gives Augustine Plato. So we go Pythagoreans, soul body dichotomy, cynics and Stoics, the introduction effectively of asceticism, the destruction of the flesh. The, the Pythagoreans were hedonists by our, any of our definitions. And so whatever license in Christian terms we would have, that we that the Pythagoreans would have demonstrated by the time we get to the cynics and Stoics most of that is gone now we're you know trying to rot our legs off to you know achieve enlightenment Plato integrates and codifies basically all of this into a full philosophical system that full philosophical system is handed pretty much whole to Augustine with the emphasis on the destruction of human existence as a primary from Plotinus. And now you know how Augustine gets from, gets what he produces from about 350 on, and Augustine's doctrine stands virtually unopposed, which, like I've said before, Augustine is really rehashed and repackaged to Plato. So they're, right? We're good, right? Got all that? You're like, what? <laughs> I do have one other player that I want to introduce here. Actually, no. I want to give you a pop quiz. Because some of you are like, that was a lot really fast. And I've not heard any of that before. <clears throat> so let me bring everybody up to speed. At the end of my last session, I said we needed to learn some things, and here is what we have to learn. You should see, right over here, this uh, weatherman thing is really hard to do. <laughs> my monitor is reversed. And I look and I see that two for second day, and I keep thinking that means two, well, second session, not second day. Anyway, you should see <clears throat> right here uh, a very complex timeline. Now, here's my challenge. Um, in an effort to uncover the historical smoking gun on the fall of man, where does that come from? Uh, there is a guy, and we're going to talk about him, and he's really the first person to use, I believe, in my semi-exhaustive study of ancient literature, and it really is semi-exhaustive, it's possible somebody else trotted this, this phrase out specifically in Christian context prior to origin, but I don't think so. <clears throat> but the problem is, is that his isn't really a smoking gun. Um, I wanted to be able to say, see, 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 here's the guy and he's really a creep. And, and if we just rejected him, we would be okay. No, none of that. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that he introduces the concept of the fall of man into Christianity 
but he is hardly a lone actor. He is consolidating. Is that the right word? He is taking his intellectual predecessor's conclusions to their logical conclusion and then grafting it into Christianity. So from my f research, he is the first person to use the phrase, the fall of man, roughly uh, circa third century. However, he is hardly a lone actor. And I think it's necessary to see the evolution from the beginning so you can understand what Origen says. And certainly in the time when within which he says it, virtually no one would have thought, now that isn't Bible. Not least of which is, <laughs> the Bible didn't exist when he was doing his writing. Indeed, most of what we would consider to be major doctrines, things that we as 21st century Christians would go, oh, absolutely, this is, you know, this is, God stuff. Most of that doesn't really exist, or it exists in a form that we wouldn't recognize. Indeed, Origen's fall of man, I'll read it to you here in a little while, but it doesn't represent, it doesn't, it's only kind of the, the vague outline, but it's hardly what you would identify as the doctrine that you understand. So I do think it's prep, um, necessary to revisit the primary intellectual evolution that led Christian thinkers to so casually frame the book of Genesis in terms of the fall of man. But <clears throat> I don't want to rehash the in-depth philosophical evolution that I've done in previous years. Uh, there's plenty of that out there. But I do think you need to see the evolution afresh. I think I need to spend a little more time than that, just that blitzkrieg that I just did. I think you need to see it laid out once again, because the evolution matters. The intellectual pedigree of modern Christianity is absolutely rooted in pagan thought. The structure that has become Christianity, this behemoth monolithic intellectual framework, is pagan thought. And there is no way to unravel the destruction you see in modern Christianity without understanding the roots of where this comes from. Now, I don't ultimately, maybe we say to ourselves, oh, I don't care, you know, it's pagan thought, so what? We just happen to call it sanctified and call it Jesus stuff. Okay, but let's be honest about where this stuff really comes from. And we already know that the fall of man, Wikipedia told us, right? It's not in the Bible, but it's a biblical doctrine. So, to that end, let's start. On your screen, you should see, weatherman imitation, um, my timeline. So, the Pythagoreans show up in the 5th century. Now, a lot has happened philosophically prior to the Pythagoreans. Will not redo. However, if you're interested, 2013 is when I do the full evaluation, I think. Um... So, and the trends within philosophy are what's really happening in Western culture. So their claim to fame is primarily rooted in the extraordinary work in mathematical discoveries, music, and astronomy. Frankly, I suspect we wouldn't even know who the Pythagoreans were without the fact that they had, they laid such an enormous intellectual foundation for those disciplines. <clears throat> However, their greatest impact is in, on culture, world culture, is metaphysics. So they said this, uh, in the beginning the soul was a godlike creature inhabiting another superior spiritual world, but it sinned. What it's, how it sinned, don't know, um, but it existed someplace else. And when it did this sin thing, it, be, it lost access to the overarching mysteries of the universe of the divine. The soul's punishment was living in the flesh in this earth. The body is therefore the prison or the tomb of the soul. So man has two parts, a high part and a low part that is in eternal conflict with each other. The human soul is divine but doomed to live, at least for a period, in what they called the grievous circle and that was its time incarcerated in flesh. Now, we're in the 5th century, 
before Christianity is even thought of. And already, Western culture is framing human lives in terms of falling, falling, from the divine or sinning against the divine and therefore being removed from the divine. And, the, and that earthly physical existence is a fundamental corruption. Hmm. So the way we get back to the divine and to participate in the mysteries, soul purification is achieved through an ascetic life that was combined within with secret initiation rites that facilitated a release from the bondage of the flesh for an eternal communion with the divine. To be free of the flesh is man's ethical ideal. Now, like I said, <laughs> don't think hunger strikes when you think of the Pythagoreans. They were, like I said, they were hedonists on levels that we in the 21st century have a hard time fathoming. So their definitions of asceticism uh, would be more on the lines of, uh, you know, I'd be like calling Hugh Hefner uh, an ascetic, right? Okay, you get the idea. So there's a lot of latitude for asceticism to mature, if you will, the denial of the flesh. There's a lot of latitude intellectually and philosophically for that to happen, which it does. So most contemporary cultures accepted that the gods were, <clears throat> now they were unique in history because they stood as a, as a divergent point. Primarily, other cultures accepted that the gods were revered, but man had a place with the gods. He, man, of course, needed to beseech the gods for various things, but it was appropriate that he did. <clears throat> Man's life might have been lesser, but this, there was still a fundamental assumed equality. But the Pythagorean's premise begins the separation between the material, the material and the spiritual. Absolutely. And here's the, the Pythagorean addition to human thought. They introduced the soul-body dichotomy into Western thought. Imagine your life if you didn't frame it as a conflict with yourself. Think for a minute. If you got up in the morning and didn't feel like you had to war with some part of yourself to achieve an outcome. That you were a unified whole. What peace would that bring? Well, you can thank the Pythagoreans and then in subsequent generations, some rabidly, uh, rabidly, what is a good word here? Metastasized, intellectually metastasized Calvinists to thank for this ongoing internal warfare. And you're like, oh, wait a minute, John, that's, that's Bible, that's Paul. Well, okay, I got it. I understand where you get it from. But what if you didn't have that fundamental separation inside of you? What if you were harmonized? What if you didn't fundamentally look at the flesh as a barrier and your spirit as somehow inferior? Just food for thought. So now, um, once again, you should see right here the timeline. And in this timeline is, I want to I skip Plato even though he comes next. And I want to talk about the Cynics and Stoics in a little bit greater detail. He ultimately, like I said earlier, Plato ultimately synthesizes all this into a full philosophical framework. But the points that he synthesizes, and remember I told you a minute ago, we'll talk about asceticism. So the cynics were called the dog philosophers. Uh, the meaning of cynic in Greek means dog. And somehow that ended up relating to the school of thought. Don't know how. Don't quite understand the etymology there, but that's what happened. Uh, they were the first street preachers uh, in Christian parlance. They were evangelists. They considered themselves humanity's watchdogs. Dare I say it? <laughs> Pun intended. Uh, <laughs> it was their job to hound people about the error of their ways. That, <laughs> that sounds like pretty much every new Calvinist I've ever met. Their favorite pastime was to publicly expose the pretense at the root of everyday convention. They believed it was their life task to convert the masses to what they called mental clarity. 
They rejected all wealth, power, sex, and fame because these pursuits were the stuff that polluted the mind into or with an internal haze. So, on some level, man's mind, when not polluted, is clear and it is through this faculty that he achieves some form of enlightenment. Uh, here is a summary of their ideology. The goal of life is mental clarity, lucidity. Freedom from internal haze, which signified ignorance, mindless folly, and conceit. Bookmark this because you'll hear this theme again. Freedom is achieved in living in harmony with nature. Mental haze, ignorance, mindlessness at all is caused by false judgments of value, which cause negative heartache, anxiety, unnatural desires, and evil character. One, pro one progresses towards flourishing and clarity through ascetic practices which help one become free from the influences of the flesh. Their goal was to beat themselves, quite literally, into a state where they gained virtue and moral freedom in liberation from desire. Now the Stoics. Stoicism is a school founded by Zeno of Sidium in the 3rd century BC. Stoa means painted porch. Zeno taught in a public square in a place called the Agora, which had a huge porch. Stoicism. Stoics taught that, the destruction of, that destructive emotions resulted from errors in judgments. Some, someone of moral and ethical perfection would not suffer such emotions. So, you, get, you see it. So now when we say somebody is stoic, when they are somehow repressing their emotional position, their emotions from within, this is where this comes from. <clears throat> the four cardinal virtues of stoic philosophy were wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Virtue alone was supposed to be sufficient for happiness. So a sage who is immune to misfortune because he is dispassionate about all things, both good and evil, um, here is Epis, Epi, Epictetus, Epictetus, my Greek is terrible, Epictetus has this quote, sick and happy yet in peril and yet happy, dying yet happy, in exile and happy, in disgrace and happy. So I suspect you will recognize the sentiments from Paul's comments in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9, we are troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Hmm. Wonder if Paul was plagiarizing the Stoics. Oh, wait a minute. No, that can't possibly be true. It's divine revelation. Paul couldn't have got that stuff from anyplace else. Right? <clears throat> so a sage achieved freedom by studying and seeking universal reason called the Logos and practicing asceticism. Um, those who practice these virtues were enlightened and can achieve freedom from the vicious materialism and emotionalism of this world. Stoics were determinists. So they said that everything is subject to the laws of fate. The Logos acts in accord with its own nature and governs matter. Souls are emanations from Logos and therefore subject to Logos dictates. They, they describe the wicked man like this, like a dog tied to a cart, impelled to go wherever it goes. So, you Calvinist aficionados, I think you'll remember you'll see the foreshadowing of this one. From the Christian deterministic traditions, it's describing man like this. A man is on hor uh, the back of a horse being led by the devil. No, John, it's biblical. It only comes from God's divine revelation. It didn't come from anywhere else. Okay. So Plato to Plotinus to Augustine, uh, weatherman imitation again, you should see right here. Timeline, so here's Plato. Um, again, he summarizes, synthesizes into a whole philosophical framework, pretty much his predecessors. Now he had some deviations and some adjustments, but for the most part, he's the one that consolidated all this into 
the profound impact that we have coming forward in, into Western thought. I have said this in previous, previous tank sessions or years, the most consistent uh, philosophical formulation is the one that wins. So most people put all their ideas into a basket, kind of toss it around and pull it out piece by piece by piece. And if it fits sort of, that's okay. If not, it disappears. Well, the problem with that is the moment you put any real pressure on the intellect, on the, on how the brain works through from metaphysical to political, that whole framework, if there's any inconsistent pieces, it causes a lot of internal conflict. So the more philosophically consistent somebody is, the more at harmony they are internally, and the more they can withstand a lot of the intellectual and philosophical pressures that they encounter. <clears throat> well, this is why the most comprehensive and the most consistent philosophical framework wins. And for the longest time, Plato's stood pretty much unchallenged. And by the time we get to Augustine, who inherits his intellectual framework from Plato, Augustine has a couple of things that he adds to, and that's what gave him such enormous intellectual power through the Dark Ages. So the intellectual pedigree, as I've said before, it goes like this. Um, Plato, via the Neoplatonist Plotinus, to Augustine, to Luther, to Calvin. That's the intellectual heritage. So modern Protestant Christianity is a repackage of Platonism. I said this before, but I really wish Christianity would be committed to truly abandoning worldly ideas. <clears throat> this intellectual framework could not be more worldly, but we have so sanctified um, this framework as Christians with so little critical evaluation that it never occurs to us, or we never, we never even consider the real roots of the body of doctrine. We get our little anthology, our Bible, our 66 books of Protestant Christianity, and we go, well, this is it. And we never pretend. We never even entertain the notion that the ideas, the way we read, the presuppositions and filters that we bring to the text are superimposed and have not one thing to do with that book. So anyway, Plato, he equals the Republic. Um, for the most part, if you want to understand Plato's overarching framework and how that applies through from uh, metaphysics to epistemology to um, ethics to politics uh, is the Republic. And the Republic is really Augustine's city of God. Um, fundamentally, lesser men are driven by their passions and not fit to rule themselves. Lesser men must subordinate themselves, a.k.a. sacrifice their base natures to the philosopher kings. Why? Again, there is always some select group of people and in, in the web of tyranny, there's always, as we're driving towards dictated good down to the center, this utopian ideal in the middle, there's always someone, some people, who is somehow exempt from the corruptions of the world, always. In, Pla in uh, Plato's world, it was the philosopher kings. They had done just that much more rigor to successfully understand what most men would never understand. So they were the ones that should be in charge. So Plotinus, the unique twist that, that Plotinus brings is he takes the framework of, of Plato and he grafts in the harshest measures of anti-human, anti-flesh, anti-material he can possibly do. Uh, brief backtrack, Plato still maintained on some level that man had some good in him somewhere. There was a humanist element. Um, man wasn't totally corrupt in the new Calvinist, Calvinist, absolute utter depravity uh, sense. Plotinus is the one who introduced that. He was the one that basically had to, it, the goal was to, to basically commit slow suicide. It was really strange. He's, his ideal was that human beings would somehow fundamentally try to die. <clears throat> Plotinus accepts the Pythagorean presumption of the corrupt material world, and then Augustine uses, well, Augustine takes Plotinus, his anti-materialism, and weaves the Pythagorean soul-body dichotomy into Christianity 
Absolutely. Augustine says that the nature of man's sacrifice is individual. And this was one specific evolution that Augustine had. Augustine introduced into Western thought the concept of individual spiritual pursuit. Pretty much everybody prior to that um, saw the framework of existence in terms of the collective. Um, and so your how to explain you sinned in groups you were virtuous in groups you are part of the group you really didn't consider yourself an individual that happened to be participating with other individuals but augustine introduces an individuality that up till that point had not been in existence augustine's morbid introspection was unique it had really never been introduced into literature as such and so he handed down that morbid introspection, that individual introspection, and just metastasized that soul-body dichotomy to the nth degree. Um, human life as such, life qua life, life as life, is the greatest threat to divine existence. And so now he's also introduced into a, a fundamental hostility into the theological equation. So man not only is corrupt, but he is... His very, is, his very presence is a threat to the divine. The, that the divine, the God, must always be in the business of putting down with impunity. The whole of his theology has a singular aim to make life unlivable and make death a moral ideal. So, again, right there, uh, you should see my timeline. And in this timeline, I want you to see where Christianity expands into the Greco warmer in the, the Greek world right around 400 AD. That's the green spot in the middle there. And in the timeline, you see where the Pythagoreans start. And then you see the resurgent cynic movement, the resurgent sophistic movement, and the resurgent Pythagorean movement. This is where Christianity shows up on the bigger scene. Um, Pretty much from the first century, Christianity is the religion of social and societal outcasts, women, slaves, and it was this stray sect um, from these fishermen in Galilee. Largely irrelevant in the broader scope of Western thought, which is one of the reasons that subsequent generations in its weakness was is it had no philosophical framework it was a collection of writings and sayings and this vague attribution to this um jewish king who came and died on a cross and so for most people it was it was okay maybe but this one distinctive uh maybe two distinctives let me think here for a second i'm summarizing some things, some thoughts in my head here. It allowed, it demanded only one fidelity, one spiritual fidelity, and that was God. Pretty much everybody else was a pantheist by, by all definitions. You could, you know, Zeus today, Apollo tomorrow, Aphrodite the day after that. It, it didn't matter, but no, if you're a Christian, it was one, one God. Um, and it accepted... And it elevated almost the societal outcast. Well, that's where it gained a lot of its social traction. But moving forward, its primary challenge was how in the heck can these stray Jesus parables ever compete in the broader school, you know, uh, Paul on Mars Hill. Um, Paul pretty much punts after he realizes he gains no traction he has no ability even though those even though the philosophers on mars hill say oh you almost persuaded us i think that was them being nice i don't really think that he almost persuaded them at all and i think that paul's reaction to go basically go pound sand and go talk to other people basically go back to the jewish diaspora and talk to people who are already familiar with his framework um really tells the story he didn't really almost persuade him. He knew he didn't. He knew he had no action. And so, you know, Paul did what he usually did. He just, you know, said, well, screw you <laughs> in Paul's own inimitable way. And so Christianity really flounders and struggles. So it's not until the framework starts to emerge that it gains any real traction. 
And one of the first players in creating that framework, and this is very high level guys. I know some of you uh, church history buffs are gonna be like, oh my God, that's not quite true. I got it, this isn't comprehensive. <clears throat> but one of those major players in the effort of becoming systematic, and I use that term very loosely because it's, there isn't much to systematize by this point. And this is a guy by the name of Origen. Um, you see him now right here, somewhere. Um, he's the guy in kind of yeah, uh, bright orange and right underneath that you see the thing that says the fall of man. So he's right around 18, his life is from 1886 to uh, 255, basically. Um, historic sources, <clears throat> we have to rely on some other dates and times to kind of peg that down, but this is when we think he is, he exists. Probably his most influential work, and he wrote a bunch is on first principles. I think I, I, I want to say back in my college days, um, for those of you who don't know, and it, honestly it doesn't matter, but for those of you who don't know and care, uh, my degree is in systematic and historical theology. I have a minor in Old Testament. I got it at Oral Roberts University. Um, yeah, the guy who said, God's going to kill me if you don't give me money. Okay, that's, who, that's where I went to school. Um, I will say though, bless their hearts, uh, it wasn't a Bible school. Um, the theology department at ORU had a real um, had a real complex. They didn't want to be known as a Bible theology department, so they were pretty hardcore. And I actually got a great uh, history education. And I said that because I was going to tell you something. Uh, what was it? Oh no, I lost my train of thought. Origin, fall of man. I totally lost my frame of thought. Anyway, so we'll move on. Um, if it comes back to me, I'll segue back into it as indelicately as possible. So I want to tell you where his intellectual traditions were. Uh, he first starts, oh, let's wait a minute. Systematic theology, systematic systematization. It's right on the edge of my thinking. Anyway, here is origins. Here's the milieu within which he comes. You've already seen the the timeline, but he also now has some pretty potent thinkers right around his same timeline. Uh, the work of Ju the Jewish Platonist Philo of Alexandria. Now, so the challenges that Christianity has is also some of the same challenges uh, societally that uh, um, um, the Jewish religion has. So still, it's a little more formulated and it's a little better, but in an effort to translate um, those traditions from Torah and so forth into the modern to the modern space with the Jewish diaspora. So here's Philo trying desperately to formulate, and he sees Plato. He thinks he sees some similar concepts, and he tries to graft them into into Judaism. Uh, then we have the Neo Pythagorean philosopher Numenius of Apamea. I don't know how to pronounce this. A P A M E A. Apamea. Numenius of Apamea, and who was Plotinus, remember? Oh wait, uh, I misstated that. So, the Neo-Pythagorean philosopher Numenius of Apamea, and I know I have a comment in here about Plotinus. Well, I think if I remember correctly and from what I read, I don't have it in my notes here, but he ended up studying with uh, Plotinus' teacher. So, we have his influences as Platonists, as Neopythagoreans, and Plotinus. So, interestingly enough, Stoic doctrines, like I, you can see there, um, once again, here's my timeline. We have a resurgent Cynic, Stoic, um, Sophic mute movement right around the middle of the first century, moving into the second century. So, that all would have been very fresh. Those sects become the Gnostic movements of the second and third centuries. Uh, the, the ideas that get Christian leaders all in a huff are the, from these people, which is funny, because those leaders ultimately shaped a large portion of early Christian thought. And this is exactly what happens with Origen. Um, 
the Stoics, or the Sophists and the Cynics were the precursor to a lot of the Gnostic ideas. However, and so Origen has those influences, but then later Origen decides to take on those fun, what he considered to be those fundamental Gnostic errors. So here's what he talked about souls and their fall. Origen taught that God's first creation were rational beings called logica. You should hear a theme there. I think that was in the, was that the Pythagoreans? The logica were not created in, in time, but rather created meaning. They had beginning, but not a temporal existence or a physical existence, but were in close proximity to God. It's a strange way to say this, where we are not really anywhere, but we have a proximity. This is a, this is a, <laughs> this is a fantastic philosophical uh, error, but nonetheless, this is what he thought. So it's not in time, meaning it's not in existence. So we're not really in time and space. However, we're close to God. Eh, it's all right. He obviously hadn't read Aristotle. Uh, and, Arist and Aristotle's uh, law of identity. <laughs> the purpose of the creation was that they would explore the divine mysteries in the state of endless contemplation. But the Logica decided they didn't like to contemplate and fell away into existence, meaning they gave up their spiritual realm and took on material being. Where have we heard this before? This is all throughout ancient Western thought. Before the fall, before the fall, their bodies were a fine, ethereal, and invisible nature. But later, as souls moved further away from the divine, their bodies changed from a fine ethereal and invisible body to a body of coarser and more solid state. So, the more morally pure, the more ethereal the body, the baser the moral state, and the more substance, the substantive the body. No rational spirit can ever exist without a body, but the bodies of redeemed souls are spiritual bodies made of the purest fire. So as a brief segue, as a brief divergence here, how many of you have ever heard that when Adam and Eve fell, the reason they became aware of their naked body is because they didn't have a physical body before they ate the fruit? Well, now you know where that comes from. Now you know where that translation, even though that's nowhere in the text, it is surmised and then superimposed. The, actual, the intellectual trail starts with the Pythagoreans and the soul-body dichotomy. This is the, this, and then this is the cynics and their determination to live in harmony with denying their flesh. This is Plotinus and his endless quest to die so, they could, so that he could unite with the light and the one. And for the Calvinist aficionados amongst us, you can read almost identical themes in Calvin's Virgins of Origins Logos, Log oh, Logica, Book 1, Chapter 15, Subsection 4. In Subsection 4, he goes into great detail about the image of God is in the soul. Its nature may be learned from the renewal by Christ. What is comprehended under this renewal? What the image of God in man was before the fall? and what it is and as appears now, and then and when and where it will be seen in perfection. Now, oh wait, who am I kidding? Calvinists don't read the IRC, and they don't believe everything Calvin believes. So anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that that's all in there, and you can see those same themes. Don't worry about it. Just ignore all that, you Calvinist aficionados. You will anyway. Anywho, so before we end this se section, before we end this session, I want to ask a couple of questions. Pop quiz. If we reject the pagan ideas that shape the doctrine of the fall of man, so if we reject the pagan ideas that shape the doctrine that we understand as the fall of man, what did man fall from? So here's what I mean. If we pretend 
of the Pythagoreans and the Cynics and the Stoics and the Sophists and Plato and Plotinus and Origen had zero influence on Christian doctrine. And we try to read the book of Genesis without any prior assumptions. But we apply the fall to Adam's actions. What did Adam fall from? I mean, did he slip on a banana and fall on his butt? Did he fall out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Falling means to move downward, typically rapidly and freely, without control, from a higher to lower level. What is the higher level? There are typically two answers given to this question. <clears throat> the first one is, he fell from innocence. Wait a minute. So he fell from innocence because he gained knowledge. He was originally innocent of that knowledge. So this is a word used to describe Adam's ignorance of his sexual nature because all sex is a sin, right? Or he was ignorant of broader knowledge. So the loose logic is that if Adam remained ignorant, if Adam never aspired to know more, he would never have committed sin. Therefore, therefore, man's ideal state is, well, infant. He can't have a relationship with God if man uses reason. Oh, well, so, web of tyranny. Notice how this dovetails into the abolition of ambition. This doctrine presumes that Man's general determination to know more is what destroyed his relationship with God. So basically, God can't handle a man that knows anything. He was really looking for a bunch, uh, a bunch of human infants to hang on to. Well, the monstrosity that implies about God is stunning, but whatever. The second answer is that he fell from grace. Okay. So here's a question for you theology aficionados. What's the problem with this conclusion? He fell from grace. He fell from grace? What is the Protestant definition of grace? Did I hear unmerited favor? Wait a minute. Adam was not created in need of grace, right? God's pronouncement over all of creation was simple. It's good. Therefore, man cannot be morally depraved, therefore in need of grace. So, if he needed grace, how does further sin make him fall? What does further sin make him fall from? Meaning, if he was morally imperfect, in need of God's unmerited favor. In other words, God had to pretend that Adam was really bad, but he was going to pretend that he was really good while he was really not really good. So, if he already starts there, and then he sins again, or sins somehow again more, how does he go farther down? He now needs more grace? So, huh? Or more precisely, God retracts his unmerited favor? that he already had, that he already given to Adam. <clears throat> but if Adam was already in need of grace, already a sinner, that means he means sin did not deprive man of access to God, right? So the logic goes that after Adam's sin, one of the reasons he gets kicked out of the garden is that now he can't have any proximity with God. He can have no relationship with God, which is why he needs a mediator, because sin offends God, it, it hurts God, it's a threat to God, right? But if he's already in need of grace, and he has very obviously a relationship with God, then that can't be right. Oh wait, is this too much critical thinking? I'm sorry. I told you, it's my job to mess with people's minds. 
But if Adam was already in need of grace, already a sinner, that means he did not deprive man of his access to God. If man had already sinned, such that he needed grace, how can he fall from fallenness? The answer is, he can't. And these questions just begin the theological stew that is created from this, from this overarching reading of the book of Genesis. The superimposition of historic Greek pagan thought on biblical Hebrew, not at all Greek writing, dramatically shades our theological conclusions. So I have this further question to ask you. What if we really tried to read the book of Genesis, and in particular the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, without any prior assumptions? Or, even better, how about if we read those books with the mind of the people who originally heard it? How would that change our understanding? We didn't come to it with a presupposition of the fall of man. But we heard it as the men and women way back, almost what, 4,000 years ago now? As they heard it. How would that impact our thinking? And that is a fantastic question. And before we answer that question, I need to teach some thinking tools.